Postpartum Support International, the Mind the Gap Coalition, and the Maternal Health Learning and Innovation Center. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here this afternoon for an overview and conversation about the White House Blueprint for Addressing the Maternal Health Crisis and how we can use it to guide all of our efforts to make the U.S. a place where we celebrate the healthiest moms and babies in the world. We're honored today to have representatives here with us from government, universities, foundations, researchers, hospital and clinic administrators, and advocates um, here today in powerful community, and we're grateful for your time joining us. So as we start, here are our learning objectives for today's webinar. We will provide a grounding in the White House Blueprint for Addressing the Maternal Health Crisis, discuss its five goals, and dive deep into two of the goals and their importance. And another objective is to provide practical strategies. And we'll hear those through moderated discussion with our expert speakers, who will share their personal and professional experiences related to the Blueprint goals. And finally, we'll share resources for improving maternal health outcomes in our communities. Overall, we're using the Blueprint as an outline to work together to build a future where the U.S. celebrates the healthiest moms and babies in the world. And this brings us to the White House Blueprint, which was just released in June of 2022 and represents a whole of government approach to addressing the interconnected challenges that contribute to the maternal health crisis our country is facing. Our nation's maternal morbidity and mortality rates are high, and they are higher than other similar situated countries, and Black women experience some of the highest rates. The White House has outlined five goals and recommended actions that we can take to address the crisis. And just yesterday, the Health Resources and Service Administration announced nearly $90 million in new grant awards to support these goals. So we start with goal one, ensuring that there's an infrastructure of health insurance available. We wanna make sure that women and birthing people have access to and coverage of high quality physical and behavioral health care. And next, we wanna make sure that the health care is respectful, that pregnant people are heard, listened to, and are decision makers in their care. Goal three then focuses on collecting the important data we need to better understand where the problems are and where to continuously target our efforts. Goal four is making sure we've got enough perinatal mental or perinatal healthcare workers with the right training, that they're located in the right places, and that they reflect the communities that they serve. And finally, goal five is the recognition that good maternal health outcomes are about the whole environment in which birthing people live. And so this goal aims to make sure that we're strengthening the economic safety and social supports that people have before, during, and after pregnancy. So we could spend several hours unpacking all five of these goals we just shared, um, but for today's discussion, we're starting to start focusing on the first two, and that's increasing access to and coverage of comprehensive, high-quality maternal health services, including behavioral health services and ensuring that those giving birth are heard and included in decision-making uh, within accountable systems of care. So to begin our discussion, I'm honored to introduce you to our three amazing maternal health leaders um, and speakers from across the country. who are going to help us think through these two blueprint goals and provide ideas and practical strategies on how we can make changes through our collective action. So first, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Attica Scott. Ms. Scott is the Director of Special Projects at Forward Justice Action Network, an organization that supports laws and public policies that advance economic, racial, and social justice in the American South. She has extensive experience galvanizing and educating communities and is a former leader in the Kentucky State Legislature. Uh, next, we'll hear from Amy Zapata, and Ms. Zapata is the Director of the Bureau of Family Health, which is located within the Louisiana Department of Health Office of Public Health, and she's an innovative and driven public health expert with policy leadership and 20 years experience revitalizing organizations and programs to produce public value. And finally, we're joined today by Unique Clark, and Ms. Clark is the lead perinatal behavioral health specialist at the DC Mother Baby Wellness Program. And this program is part of the Developing Brain Institute at Children's National Hospital here in Washington, DC. 
and Unique has been a leader in expanding perinatal mental health services in a busy community-based pediatric setting within the children's hospital system. And she's recognized for her advocacy, expanding mental health treatment for black women and people of color. So for the remainder of our time today, we're gonna to be in a roundtable discussion, which I'm really thrilled to moderate. And here's how it'll work. Um, I'll pose these questions, a few questions to each speaker, and Amy, Attica, and Unique will share their experience and expertise. And please, as we're moving through the discussion and you have questions, you can go ahead and put them in the Q&A box, and uh, we will have a portion for Q&A at the end of the discussion. Um, so I'm going to turn to Attica. Thank you, Attica, for being here with us today. And we really appreciate you for all the work you're doing to advance racial justice throughout the South. We've asked you here today, um, and so I invite you to, to unmute um, and, and um, be part of our discussion. I'm really grateful. We've asked you to join us here today um, because of your incredible leadership, your wisdom and experience advocating for folks who have not been heard by their healthcare providers or their other systems. And so in exploring this goal, we're just really pleased to have you with us. Um, so can you share with us why this blueprint goal um, of making sure those people, that people giving birth are heard and included in their care decision-making, why is that so important? Thank you so much, Maggie, for the invitation to be part of this conversation today. And, and I have to say, as a Southern woman, somebody who's deeply grounded in the South and who has served in both local and state office, it's important to me that I return to my roots as a community-based grassroots um, advocate and share my experience as someone who grew up in the projects here in Beecher Terrace in Louisville. And I know personally what it's like to not be heard, to not be listened to, but when you want to create good public policy that addresses public health, it's important to listen to people who are most directly impacted by poor health outcomes. And so that's what brings me to this conversation today. Yeah. And, and so um, in your experience, both reflecting on your own personal experience and as well as serving in the legislature and community organizing, um, I wonder, can you reflect with us what can happen um, when women and, and people in their healthcare uh, decision making are not heard or part of the decision making process? Well, what can happen is, is what we have now. You have a state where I live, Kentucky, that ranks at the bottom, of, according to America's health rankings and um, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, because we're not listening to the people from urban, rural, and suburban areas who are crying out for support, for care, and for us to create caring communities that center their experiences and center their voices. If we don't listen to people who are experiencing police violence or gun violence or who are living in poverty, then we're going to continue to create policies that have intended and unintended consequences. So in order to make sure we're creating policies that don't unintentionally harm people or even intentionally harm people, we have to make sure that as local and state elected officials, we are constantly in community working with bouncing ideas off of people who are experiencing um, you know, poor birth outcomes, for example, or who may be living in poverty and not have access to the health care that they need. Mm -hmm. Right, so what can happen is, is what we're seeing um, in so many communities. Um, and um, could you share a story, maybe Attica, from your experience either as a legislator um, or, or a community organizer, um, you know, of how you, you navigated that, of, of how you, you know, saw a situation where people weren't heard um, and, um, and, and shared, you know, your your opportunity to um, to lift their voice up, and and what kind of difference that made. Certainly, Maggie, I appreciate that. I, I have to say that. I was the activist legislator who brought my advocate and organizer experience to the state legislature, but it was the people who were directing the work that I would do as somebody with that positional privilege. So I was following and listening to the leadership of the ACLU of Kentucky and Black Birth Justice and the Louisville Coalition for Black Maternal Health and Sister Song, Women of Color Reproductive Justice Collective, because 
together we wanted to create these accountable systems of care that the White House Blueprint talks about. And we also convened a huge meeting with state workers to say, okay, um, those of you from different departments that touch maternal health, what's the data, what's the evidence that you could share with us to help shape this public policy? And we refused to be silent while maternal mortality continued to be a crisis in the United States and in Kentucky. And what I know from my heart and soul, Maggie, is that when we work with folks who are directly impacted, we can get to good public policy. And that's what we try to do in coalition and in collaboration with community folks. Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought that up, bringing together the folks across state government. And I would assume probably, um, you know, healthcare providers are there. Um, and, you know, we hear this where healthcare providers, you know, individually, I think most fear really want to do a good job and they want to make sure that, that, um, you know, they're hearing, but they're also working in systems that, you know, mandate a, a 10 minute appointment and, you know, kind of are, are challenging to navigate. So, um, you know, practically speaking, what do you think um, are some of those um, changes that can help systems do a better job of listening and ensuring that people um, giving birth are heard and are um, decision makers in their care. Yeah, thanks for that question, Maggie. As, as um, it, it says in the, the PowerPoint slide, I work at Forward Justice Action Network. So I center justice. And everything that you said is absolutely right and important. And we also have to make sure that healthcare systems, institutions are addressing institutional and systemic and structural racism. It's real and it can be a difficult conversation to have, but we get nowhere if we refuse to have a conversation or we get to what you said earlier on, Maggie, which is, um, these poor health outcomes. We don't listen to people. And so um, they struggle with having healthy pregnancies and births. So we've got to address the real issues that exist in our well-meaning institutions and systems and structures. And we have to do that together. So addressing implicit bias, addressing institutional and systemic racism, making sure that there's continuous education around these very issues and that the systems aren't repeating and recreating the harm that so many of the folks we're talking about have experienced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what what are um, some of the things in your experience that that you've seen work and and maybe some some change um, that you've witnessed where you know someone who previously maybe had had a negative experience had not felt heard um, a policy changed and they they did um, can you can you talk about maybe tell us a story about a situation where where that might have happened. Yes, well, I really love the work of doulas in North Carolina, and we've been trying to replicate some of that work here in Kentucky, where doulas coming in and being part of the healthcare system has helped to improve birth outcomes for pregnant people, because you have a partner in your healthcare experience. I know myself, when I was a new mom, I didn't know what questions to ask when I was pregnant. I didn't know what questions to ask when I was giving birth, and I certainly didn't know what questions to ask as a follow-up, but having someone like a doula who is that support partner right next to you and being able to ask questions you wouldn't think about asking because you may be under stress or you, you may be your first time um, giving birth and you don't have uh, a model or mentor to look to maybe in your family or friends um, unit to help you think about the questions to ask is so important. So when we make sure that there's Medicaid reimbursement for doula support services, for example, that's mm -hmm. a good public policy. When we make sure that these healthcare systems um, aren't afraid to open their doors to people who are walking with the pregnant person through their journey, we get good um, birth outcomes. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, doula. Uh, doula. So um, I, I think that's a really great segue into one of the, the last things um, thinking about our participants on the call today. We have folks across state government, um, local government, academics, researchers, um, advocates, organizers. And I'm just wondering um, you know, if you could say to them um, you know, what they can do now in their role, thinking about all of these different roles, maybe pick a couple. I know they have named a few. Um, that that you would you would say to them, you know, this is something that you can can do um, in your work to ensure um, that people giving birth are heard and are decision makers in in accountable care systems. Yeah, thanks, Maggie. Y'all listen to folks. I mean, we we. Um, I, as I said, my first time being pregnant, I at least I understood my body and I knew my body and I knew when something 
wasn't right. And so my, my second pregnancy was a high risk pregnancy. And, and so it matters when you listen to people, right? You have a certain level of expertise and so do the people who are carrying this life inside of them. So listen, be a partner with folks. Um, you know, we, we're all in this learning journey if we're honest about it. So be a partner with people, listen to what they have to say, but also deepen your understanding of the things that may make you uncomfortable, whether it's racism or sexism or homophobia, whatever that may be, or people living in poverty, deepen your understanding of those realities. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Annika. I think that thank that you. brings us um, a little bit to, um, to where we're going to pivot over to Amy, but I really hope that, um, you know, when we go to the Q&A, especially, I know folks are going to want to hear more about your experience as well. Um, so Amy, I'm, I'm excited to, to turn to you, um, for discussion on, uh, another blueprint goal, which is this goal of increasing access to and coverage of high quality maternity care services, and that including behavioral health services for pregnant and postpartum people. And as we all know, access to physical and behavioral health care is fundamental um, to healthy outcomes for mothers and babies. And, you know, it's, it's just a fundamental goal. So can you tell us, um, practically speaking, in your role um, in Louisiana, how do you make sure that Louisiana's mothers and birthing people have access to maternity care, um, including physical and behavioral health services? Sure. So I would say good afternoon and thank yes. you so much for having thank me. You. It's um it's gonna be hard for me to not share too many examples of what we're of what we're doing. Um and this work has been some of the deepest um and most rewarding work um so far, I would say uh definitely of my career. Um one of the main ways is in my capacity as the administrator of the Maternal and Child Health Block Grant, um, which is called Title V of the Social Security Act. Um, this grant is something that every state receives for public health activities to monitor, protect, and promote the health of women, children, children with special health care needs, and families. Mm -hmm. It's the only a funding source that has the charge to improve the health of all women, all, all pregnant individuals and parents, uh, parenting um, uh, families. Um, and so it's not just focused on um, one particular issue or one particular task. It's also something that every state has, state, state and territory has. Mm -hmm. And both Medicaid and Title V are um, statutorily mandated to coordinate and collaborate, which means these two really big pieces of every public health system in every state and jurisdiction are required to work together. So everyone who's on this call today has at least one single point of contact who they could contact in their state if they know not who, who else they should contact. And that's your state um, maternal and child health director or you can look on the, the, um, the Maternal and Child Health Bureau's website. Every state's um, action plan is on, online there. And so my job then, um, in terms of the, the, the three main areas, I would say the three things that I focus on to address access to maternal and behavioral health services are through data to inform and clarify needed actions, through policy that enables and then reinforces um, the change we wanna see, and then support for our systems to execute. I have a couple of examples if you'd like to give me, uh, if you'd like me to give two or three examples. Um, sure, actually, that was going to be my next question. Okay. So, right. so that works out, just some practical examples okay. of, of how you've um, done those things. Sure. So one thing I think about first is what are the mandates that I have and what are the authorities that I have or that my section has and how can I use them to clarify issues, to align efforts or to scale and spread solutions um, and I would say one exciting thing with a blueprint like this, and when there's funding um, a lot, there's a lot of activities and a lot of them sound similar. So I think aligning and being clear of what's being done is really um, is really uh, the, the work, uh, the work ahead. Mm -hmm. um, so on the data side of things, so if I'm thinking about what are my mandates and authorities are on the data side of things, one of our main um, uh, data sources is our pregnancy associated mortality review, and it is our action and our action focus report that comes out of that. That has become a real powerhouse for change. It, we've I supported it originally with Title V funding before there was categorical funding for it or national uh, national focus. And in data, the, in Louisiana, these data are reviewed in partnership with advocates and representatives um, and uh, along with system partners, practitioners, um, and individuals with lived experience. Um, CDC has a really fantastic um, data action logic model so again, if I'm going data, policy, and systems change. Mm -hmm. On the policy side, we have 
boards and commissions that are under our purview that we um, that we administer directly. So I, I already have to do something. And so how do I use those to line up efforts or to mobilize or to elevate um, the, the, the voices and experience of people? Um, and so um, it's through our boards and commissions and councils that we've been able to um, uh, write policy briefs that ultimately um, contributed to the state implementing postpartum coverage for 12 month continuous coverage mm -hmm. um, or for a separate pay payment um, for a long acting reversible contraception or um, or establishing a voluntary registry um, for doulas. And then last, um, our support. So if it's policy, if it's data policy and support, no matter what we're doing or what we're working on, we have the same four drivers of improvement through our perinatal quality collaborative or really anything we're doing. And that is uh, reliable uh, clinical practices, respectful patient partnership, effective teamwork and cultivating leadership for change. Um, and so our perinatal quality collaborative is one, but not, not the on, only um, area where we're doing that work. Uh, um, with you mentioned the announcement yesterday of funding, mm -hmm. and we're very pleased to see that we um, were funded again um, for our uh, provider provider consultation line, which is uh, is working to support a no cost line to support um, professional support and development for um, individuals who are, who are working on behavioral health challenges um, and needs um, for pregnant and parenting individuals. So those are three of the the main areas and a couple of examples. Yeah, I, I want to go back to something that you said um, at the start when you were talking about data, Amy, mm -hmm. and the, the Maternal Mortality Review Committee, and you mentioned that, you know, it was something where it had um, discre maybe discretionary funding, and then you put it under Title V. Um, that, that's an interesting um, strategy that might be of interest to some folks on the call. Can you talk about that? Sure, it was actually the reverse. In that oh, okay. before, before there was funding, before there was a national funding stream to support uh, or federal funding stream to support um, maternal mortality reviews is something that um, that I use Title V funds to build an infrastructure for and to start working on. And so thankfully, um, now there are there is a federal funding and our Title V block grant supports um, still does support quite a bit of the infrastructure for that work. Um, but I think of Title V as um, because it does have some flexibilities um, it does have some flexibility to what you can do. I often am using it to um, to incubate um, things or test things um, that we're trying to decide if we want to or need to set up something a longer term um, a longer term system for. So mm -hmm. I, we also I also use Title Five funds to establish initially um, the um, the perinatal quality collaborative as another as another example. So Title Five is is a really good source um, and it is also then a, a, a source to consider then as you're uh, spreading and scaling or mobilizing um, different um, different interventions. It's a it's a really good um, point of contact um, for um, individuals to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I I wonder too. You know that we have a, a number of people who are listening to the webinar who are in similar positions to yours within state or local government, and and I'm um, wondering. You know what actions would you recommend to state leaders in similar positions to yours? Um, not just on this, you know, this Title Five Maternal Mortality Review Committee piece, but um, but uh, actions that you would recommend that they take to increase access to. Um, maternal health services and and thinking holistically about that and not just physical care but also the the behavioral health services as well I think that the I think actually the blueprint <laughs> lays out a lot of mm -hmm. of um of tangible actions um I went as I was going through it I was highlighting the ones where we've done something and I was highlighting off to the side the ones um, where we haven't done something and even even the recommendations in the blueprint that um, that might look like they are for a specific population such a, or a specific group such as um, becoming the employer of choice. Um, sorry, the employer by example, I think of the benefits offered for federal employees or for v types of services offered through VA. I would say even those recommendations, even if not, we're not working in that particular system, you could still look at those recommendations and say, is it something where you have influence of us over a similar system or that you could mobilize change over um, in your state for, for similar requirements? Um, and so for me, the, the, the tangibles are really looking, I, I would also encourage people to look for their pregnancy associated mortality reviews. Not every state does have it, um, or you could look at ours, <laughs> um, our, our publication where we've really been working hard 
to have it not just be an action body that is just sort of discerning what's happening in our state, but we're making very, very specific system by system recommendations. And I would guess that probably the recommendations um, for policy change or for system change in Louisiana are probably similar to a lot of other states. Right. I, I think kind of carrying on that theme of similar to other states, um, of course, states and the U.S. is very diverse and, and are, you know, we have a lot of pockets in the country. Uh, well, no, they're not pockets. They're huge areas, um, rural areas without necessarily a ton of access to an immediate health care provider. And I know this is something that you've um, dealt with in Louisiana and worked on. Um, can you uh, help us give us some idea of how you address this goal of access to care um, in a rural area? And what are some things that you have to keep in mind when you're thinking about ensuring access um, to maternity care for people who may live hours away from the nearest um, healthcare provider? I think for me, it, it comes then um, still back down to what do we want to see for every mom, every baby, every family, and what are the levers of, of authority that we have? Um, or the level, the platforms um, to mobilize change. And so for me, um, in terms of rural health and rural access, um, I think some of that's been addressed by, um, we we did actually use the CDC locate tool, which was one of the recommendations. And um, we worked with all the birthing facility or most of the birthing facilities in the state um, to assist them with completing that. And then from there worked with um, them and our hospital association and advocates um, to redevelop the levels of care um, requirements mm -hmm. for licensure. And in there, we actually put a requirement um, uh, that um, that all birthing facilities ultimately need to participate in some way in our Louisiana Perinatal Quality Collaborative and one or more of our initiatives or designation systems. Um, and so I think some of it is, um, is looking at what, what laws um, and policies you have access to and using those tools to identify that. Another um, that we have done is um, we do have some very specific, um, we will be working with, through our perinatal quality collaborative, working with um, emergency departments around the state um, mm -hmm. for around um, recognition of obstetric emergencies. And, um, and um, you know, probably some, while I see in, in the blueprint, it looks like it's around being readiness for delivery. But I think a lot of what we're also seeing is readiness to recognize and respond to and, and quickly respond to um, other uh, emergencies that, that are be, can become life-threatening, whether it's hemorrhage or hypertension. Um, another way that we're working on that is our our um, provider to provider uh, consultation line um, related to uh, behavioral health services um, and trying to increase the capacity of frontline um, providers um, to be able to recognize and respond to um, behavioral health concerns. The last thing I would want to say, or potential concerns, the last thing I would want to say is our um, rural hospitals have actually been some of the leaders in quality improvement um, in our state, especially as it pertains to our um, improving um, the, the care for substance exposed dyads. Mm -hmm. um, and I think part of that is um, there's a really, really high level of engagement of physicians in some of our rural hospitals and sort of all hands on deck in the work that's in the work that's occurring. Mm -hmm. And it's also, um, it, there's also uh, a, lot, a good familiarity with um, their local communities. So I think there's, um, while the rural presents particular challenges, I think also there's deep expertise and deep knowledge in a place where um, you actually can test some things that um, need to be tested to work at a larger scale. That's really interesting and kind of goes back to what we were saying about, you know, listening to the community of people who uh, were affected mm -hmm. um, that Correct. can happen at all levels. So um, I really appreciate that, that comment. I think um, just one more thing. And uh, while, while we're still here talking and then we have lots of time um, at the end too, for questions, um, what would you want to share um, with, you know, your, your role is in psych state government and, you know, you have, the, the structures that you work in. Um, but we have a lot of folks on this call and, and uh, people who are interested in working with government who may not be uh, inside. And so how would you um, it's think about and, and you know, recommend that advocates outside of government um, to work in partnership with their um, uh, representatives in state and local government? Mm -hmm. Um, I would say if you have an idea or you have an issue or something that you're trying to address, please, um, please let us help you um, elevate it, help clarify it, help us make sure that it that we're that we're aware of it. 
And I, um, I think when we found that we've actually worked on quite a number of legislative um, study resolutions and reports putting out very specific recommendations. And I think the best policy has been coming out over the past couple of years when um, individuals with lived experience and who are the major advocates and who are the providers are coming together with, um, with us um, and we're able to provide some of the, the data information as well as the, identify the particular policy levers where change um, might have the intended or unintended effects and if we're working hand in hand, that's really been, been the best. Um, but it's like, well, who do I call? Who do I call in state government? I would say, again, you could look in the Maternal and Child Health Bureau's um, website. And if nobody else, you can um, you can look at your for your, who is your Title V um, administrator. There are great points of contact in the plans. Many states also have a pregnancy associated mortality review. That could be Googled as another point of contact. Many states also have a perinatal quality collaborative. And, and with the funding that was released, um, uh, recently, there are also many states that have designees for maternal health uh, task force. In some cases, these all these activities are happening under the same umbrella. So in our case, a lot of them ha are happening under the auspices of, of my, my section. Mm -hmm. um, but those are some really concrete points of contact if you want to if you want to um, to work with um, with government to um, on on your different initiatives. But I think the best comes when we're working both inside and outside towards shared aims. Yeah. Thank you for that. And those are really practical tips. So I really appreciate that. And um, we will hear more from you, Amy, during the Q&A. So thank you for sharing all of that valuable information. Um, Unique, I'm so excited to talk with you now um, because your personal and professional experience really aligns um, with what we've heard from Attica and Amy so far and these two goals that we see um, on the screen. And so you've, you've shared with us that you've personally experienced um, what shared decision-making looks like with your health care provider and your own experience and, and what it means to be listened to and supported, um, as well as bringing your professional experience here, um, working um, with pregnant and postpartum people every day in Washington, D.C., and helping them navigate and access services and supports and um, supporting them in, in their perinatal mental health. Um, so hearing your story is just so vital to this conversation, and we really appreciate you being here with us. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. And and so I'm I'm going to start off. You've shared with us that you have three young children of your own, um, keeping you busy. So you come to this work with a lot of personal experience. And um, you know, I wanted to start the conversation just with um, your own um, journey during pregnancy, birth, and postpartum with your oldest child. I think is is what you shared that launched you on this path. And um, so what was your experience um, accessing maternal health services and behavioral health services um, during your pregnancy and, and kind of what, what worked for you? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, my oldest is five years old now. Um, so it's been a little while, but still close enough. Mm -hmm. um, and I think just transitioning into parenthood, my husband and I made that conscious decision. And I understand like I'm speaking from a place of privilege too, of being married, educated, coming from a two parent household. Still, we know that the data, when we look at educated black women in the birthing space, the numbers of mortality and morbidity are much higher than white un uneducated women or under-resourced women. Mm -hmm. So for us, our journey started preconception. Um, I had to have a surgery that automatically meant that all of my future pregnancies were going to be cesarean deliveries, which put me at a higher risk. Um, and even before becoming pregnant with my daughter, we had a loss and it was a pretty intense um, experience for us. I was literally at work going through a miscarriage, didn't know what was going on with my body. My provider was messaging me that I needed to urgently come back in. And I had to explain to my supervisors, like, I don't know when I'll be back. I'm not sure exactly what's going on, but here's what's happening. Mm -hmm. And graciously enough, they were really understanding and really supported me through the entire process. And I understand, again, not everybody has that privilege or the supportive work experience like that. Eventually, um, a couple months after that miscarriage, we found out that my mother had terminal cancer. Um, and a couple months after finding out about her diagnosis, I became pregnant again. So a large part of my pregnancy was not only diet, um, navigating my own prenatal appointments, but also like being present for her, trying to be present for my brother and sister who were taking care of her. 
driving two hours back and forth at home to try and navigate all of those appointments and all of the care and things that my family needed. The thing that stuck out to me the most is like my provider, every time that I walked in, it's like she automatically remembered everything that we had discussed the day before or the visit before. And I even remember commenting to her like, what kind of notes are you taking? Because <laughs> this is, it's really remarkable that you remember all these parts. So she did a really good job of like getting a really detailed history of what I had experienced with other care providers and other surgeries and really asking me questions and saying upfront, like, that doesn't exactly sound right. I'm going to do more and we're going to figure this out. Um, fortunately for me, um, you know, she was with me the whole step of the way. I was able to schedule around when she would be in the hospital and I felt most comfortable with her. Yeah. Even when it came time to doing um, maternity health, the ward tours, um, you know, she gave us the options of where we could go deliver that she had privileges. I came back, I had a conversation with her about where I liked, where I didn't like. And she was pretty upfront with me about given your health, given my own experience as a provider, this is the safest place for you to deliver. And I really took that to heart because she could have easily said nothing and said, okay, we'll go ahead and book you. But she really took the time to get to know me, to get to know my family. She consistently asked it about my mother at every visit. When my mom was there, she answered all of her questions. When my husband showed up, she answered all of his questions. And I know that these visits were only 20 minutes, but it literally felt like I was there for like two hours with a friend, just kind of having casual conversation about what was going on with me. Um, and so eventually, um, had baby. She, we did extra visits postpartum, um, mm -hmm. but probably within like six weeks, things kind of took a turn. My husband returned back to work and I was home with a baby. Um, and at that point, and now I realized I was experiencing postpartum anxiety and having a lot of intrusive thoughts. Um, and those thoughts kind of led to some OCD type behaviors that I now know as a perinatal mental health provider. Mm -hmm. Um, and there was so much shame. And I was working as a therapist at the time in a different capacity. And there was so much shame around the thoughts that were swirling in my head of, I'm a professional in this space. I'm supposed to have the answers. This isn't what I am supposed to be experiencing. Mm -hmm. So quite frankly, I didn't tell anybody. And I don't think I really disclosed it to even my husband until long after. Um, I think my child was like on her way to one. And I finally said, like, here's what was happening in those first few weeks. Wow. Um, and again, just like the shame around what was going on with me internally kind of kept me quiet. The first pregnancy I had. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for sharing your story with us. First off, I, that's a lot to, to remember those feelings and to go back there. So I, I really appreciate it. And a couple of things are sticking out to me as you're saying, I mean, one is, is just that that what you said about your provider, that even though you were with her for 20 minutes, it felt like you know, she was remembering everything about you and, and, um, you know, we have providers with us, I think today, are there, there are things that, you know, just recommendations that you would make to others of, you know, how, how did, what did she do that made you feel that way? Um, and, and, um, there's, I just think that that would be, um, helpful for folks to hear those practical tips too, now is in your work as a social worker, um, and, uh, um, the perinatal mental health therapist, um, what are those practical tips? Yeah, I think now that I think about it, the thing that she always does is she comes into the room, she never touches the computer. She just sits down and literally asks me like, how are you doing? How have things been going? I remember the last time I saw you, you were working on X, Y, and Z professionally. Like, how are the kids? How are your husband? And that's even before we till this day started an exam. And again, it might just be two minutes, right. but like, it's a powerful couple minutes of just tell me about you before I dive into what we're here to accomplish medically. Mm -hmm. um, and just as a standard practice for where I go as well, they always give me a patient health questionnaire nine. And during pregnancy, I got an Edinburgh postnatal depression scale to kind of gauge where I was with my own anxiety symptoms or depression. And from there, she could go into the system and say, like, it looks like 
you know, the behavioral health unit has some openings. Here's the number. Go ahead and get an appointment. Um, my medical charts were linked and I allowed access for that. So she could mm. also see and kind of double check of like, you have an appointment coming up and it would be on my after visit summary of not only medical health appointments, but also like any therapy appointments I had as well. So it was a double edge kind of reminder and safety net of what, um, you know, I needed to take care of. Right. Yeah. Wow. And, and those, just that follow-up or we, you know, in policy, they call it like warm handoffs. Um, but, Mm -hmm. but what does that really look like in practice, you know, is, is just kind of making that final step and all, and, and, you know, what you're saying at the, the beginning of the appointment, that's so critical is two minutes, just look, you know, don't go straight to the computer and, and be here together. I think that's, that's really critical. Um, and, I, you know, I'm, I wanted to ask you now to, to kind of think about your professional experience too, and, and reflect on, um, you know, maybe what you, you had this experience that you had this supportive provider who followed up with you. And I would imagine that, that in your practice, you know, you might encounter people that, that don't have that or that, that struggle. I mean, can you kind of reflect on, what are you hearing um, from your patients about the things um, that they need um, in, mm-hmm. in prenatal and postpartum care? Yeah, I really, um, a common theme is like not knowing what to expect, like a lot of questions around what prenatal care looks like. What is the hospital going to look like? What is the delivery process going to look like? It's a lot of like, I do not know. So even in the space of therapy is asking those questions. And I always tell my clients, like I'm an open book. And if you have the question, ask it. So that way I can get you connected to the resource you need. Mm-hmm. Fortunately enough for our program is we have care coordinators. So I can, I easily have somebody that I can access to say like, hey, can you connect this person to a doula? This person needs help with WIC. This person needs help with SNAP. This person needs help with housing. And it allows me and gives me the space as a therapist to just handle the feelings part. So I think that piece has been really, really critical and crucial. Um, Another thing that comes up a lot, and it's so simple when we thought about it all together, is thinking about moms taking care of themselves postpartum and like, are you eating? Are you sleeping? Mm -hmm. And something as simple as like, a water filter for their house because we know DC has an issue with lead pipes. Like, how do we get you access to a Brita or water bottles or making sure that you were drinking water? You know, what are easy meals that you can make? Postpartum Support International has a beautiful postpartum plan. And I use that as a part of my sessions for those who can't attend the webinars of like, let's break this down for you. Mm-hmm. Like, what are good nutritious foods? How can you access it? who are the supports, who can be there for you, who can step in and drop off a meal if you don't want everyone in your home. Just kind of thinking about what are the low hanging fruit that we can tackle together to make the postpartum experience much more enjoyable and meaningful than may, it may have been the first time around. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I think those really tangible things that I I remember, you know, in my own experience, having that big, you know, mug of water next to me at all times, because you forget, you just, it, it all goes. Um, So I think, um, you know, those are what you're saying, those tangible things. I'm wondering a little bit more, you know, kind of systemically, especially as it relates to being listened to or having access to care, um, you know, some of the concerns um, or needs that you are you hear from your your um, patients. And I'm thinking things like um, like what Attica shared about, you know, having a doula present and that, you know, having somebody with you um, or, you know, uh, child care for the, the your older children when you need to go to appointments for your, for your pregnancies. I mean, are there kind of maybe two to three things that you hear a lot that folks um, on the, the webinar can kind of think about as places for, for action that would really be meaningful um, for pregnant Yeah, absolutely. People. Um, quite a few of our patients, of course, like this isn't first pregnancy. So even accessing doctor's appointments post COVID, the hospital policies didn't allow extra visitors, but they would count like a small baby as a visitor. So it was really a scramble for a lot of our folks that we were seeing of like, 
yes, I am pregnant again, but I don't have the extra support to watch this baby. And it really became like a point of crisis for people of like, do I sacrifice my own prenatal appointments because I don't have someone to watch my child? Um, and thinking about too, of like how to capitalize on the programs that are available through Medicaid and other insurance programs, like looking at meal delivery service options that are available, accessing, of course, like getting breast pumps, lactation consultants, even therapists that are specialized in perinatal mental health that are provider of preference through the insurance companies. Mm. Um, and just thinking about the folks that may have like, um, commercial insurance, really capitalizing on all of those benefits, thinking about short-term disability, you know, dependent care, flex spending, mm -hmm. HSAs, the healthcare spendings, um, you know, really making it and thinking. I think there she is. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm, That's I okay. don't know. I'm not sure what's happening with my webinar. Um, but anyways, okay. just really capitalizing on like all the resources that are there. One thing I do want to mention is that DC just passed legislation to allow for and pay for doula. So that's really a beautiful marker of how to move the ball forward to get adequate care. I hope commercial insurances follow suit ASAP to get doula services covered for those who hold private insurances. And that's how we really take care of those in the birthing space. And it truly has a ripple effect because if we don't have the time to heal and take care of ourselves physically and mentally, the return to work is, is pretty impacted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that is actually a really great segue to a question that we've gotten um, from a couple people thinking about incorporating um, doula care. Um, so I'm going to ask all of our presenters um, if we can come on to the, uh, the Q and A session. Um, so I'm not, I, um, let's see, I'll give a second to get everybody spotlighted. Um, but just while we're waiting for that, I'll, I'll ask the question and kind of be thinking about it in your mind. Um, and, um, if you start, start with Unique and move to Annika and Amy, um, what strategies have you seen with incorporating doulas into the health system um, that have been most successful? Um, and yeah, this question asks um, about provider acceptance as part of a medical team and how can we incorporate doula services into the healthcare system to make it, to make their care more easily available and accessible? Um, so maybe unique, you want to start with the experience in DC and then we can um, move to Attica and Amy. Yeah, like I just mentioned, like there's a legislation to get dual services covered by Medicaid and the rate is great. And I've sat in on some of those meetings where the task force that started it was really open to listening to the duals about like what is equitable pay? What makes it worth it? How do we expand services to cover postpartum? Um, so I feel like DC is definitely making some headway and still ways to go about, um, you know, coverage because it's, I think for what we see with doulas, especially for our patients who have no supports, the doula oftentimes winds up being the only person in the room with them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we have to think about as well is like, why have a mother birth by herself when we could have someone who is there, who is being paid, who is supportive, who can keep her safe, quiet as it's kept. Um, and really protect our birthing people, especially our Black birthing people. Yeah, Maggie, um, appreciate this question. I will say that in Kentucky, there's been more done by the legislature to support midwives and, and midwifery support than doula support. So mm -hmm. what we have are, especially with um, Black doulas, is that they're doing the work regardless, right? That they you know they need to go into their communities and take care of pregnant people. Yeah. So they're not looking for state approval, right? Because um, you know the state has never approved of, of Black people, if we're honest about it. So they do their work um, regardless, but it's the midwives who have gotten the legislative support to be able to have licensure and to be able to accompany pregnant people in um, to the, the birthing room at a medical facility or to have access to medical records or to even work on getting prescriptions for um, not be able to prescribe, but to recommend 
um, medication for people who are pregnant. So that same thing has not been afforded to, um, similar support has not been afforded to doulas through policy in Kentucky, but maybe other states like North Carolina um, has definitely done better work around that. Mm -hmm. Amy, anything to add there? No, I think there's, I think there's probably a lot more fertile ground right now in terms of policy and formal recognition and, and towards payment. Um, uh, there's some really good briefs I don't know if it's Nash P or some of the other, there's some a, a bunch of good briefs, I think, around that. Um, in Louisiana, we have a, a voluntary registry for doulas. Um, that was a law, I think that was two years ago, that's under our purview to support. Um, and um, and I think part of the foundational work was actually defining what is a doula um, and, mm -hmm. and for the doulas themselves to come up with some uh, common definitions and then um, and then also great emphasis on it that it be voluntary and that it not be something that's required. Um, to me, I think it's about um, then making it clear what 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 are people doing, what are they not doing, um, and then um, making sure that there's visibility on the um, on the resources that are available. So I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful in a, a few different ways. One, that there will be the opportunities um, both for payment and otherwise uh, for doulas to be more recognized as a formal um, asset in the healthcare delivery system and that there be compensation for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this question um, from the audience is from Attica. Um, they're asking, you know, what are some key lessons learned that you have um, in your position coming out of the state legislature about, you know, what gets um, attention of decision makers and um, how to garner support, um, particularly as it relates to health equity um, and promoting uh, the needs of Black and Brown women and birthing people? Yeah, I appreciate that question. What I learned is that we have to work in coalition and community and collaboration with one another. Um, we're not going to get anywhere as this one individual organization or that one individual organization. It's when there's a group of people who are coming together and applying pressure to local and state legislators. Um, sadly, sometimes it's that pressure that gets them to move. So when we move with one voice, when we're moving with um, one goal, then we're able to get you know, either some policy created at the state level, or if we're not able to get it done at the state level, we can go back home to our own backyards and get some policy created at the local level. Sometimes people want to go directly to DC or directly to their state capital and sometimes miss the work that can happen back home in their backyard. So I encourage folks, look at the work that you can do it with your local elected officials that you may not be able to get done anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Um, and this question is for Unique. Uh, what what do you say is currently missing um, in research and training for um, for higher education regarding maternal mental health conditions? Um, and I, I think what they're kind of trying to get at too is um, how what what training um, for people who might be interested in perinatal mental health um, is available uh, and or that needs to be available that's not available right now. It's really interesting because I didn't find out about like this space of work well into well into my own career. Um, and it came from a situation with a patient who I was seeing her child, but shared her birth trauma. And I just remember being like so rattled inside. I did not know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. and I felt awful in the moment that I had no response to help in a sense. Um, so I think one, like postpartum support international is a great place to start to think about diving into the work of maternal mental health. And thinking about how do we expand for like graduate programs to do like specialty seminars or concentrations. I know that there are some available for like public health around like maternal health. Um, I think it really means taking a look at like a specializing within the field, even here um, with children's, we've had some conversations with my alma mater, the School of Social Work around like how do we create an internship for MSW students to come here and get a taste of what it's like to be a mental health professional in the maternal and perinatal mental health space, really bolstering that um, behavioral health workforce of like, you know, it's not just doctors that specialize, but other practitioners can specialize as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's so important to to do that education, as you say, to give that um, experience for what a career like this could look like. Um, I think we have time 
uh, where I'm going to, I'm going to do a really quick question for everybody. Um, you know, kind of what, um, in your positions as, as leaders, um, how do you think people within, um, government? So, you know, within either local state legislature government can really work with people outside, um, and work together to ensure, um, access to maternal health services and behavioral health services too, not, not just those physical, but also the mental. So I'll open it up to anybody who wants to kind of address that real quick as we wrap up. I'll just chime in to say that um, one is acknowledging that as a legislator, you have a certain level of expertise in a certain issue, but other people have much more than you. So mm -hmm. work with the folks who have the expertise, right? Who have the exp experience, the lived experience and the academic experience. Don't ever under um, uh, value the lived experience because just because somebody doesn't have a degree doesn't mean they don't have, they haven't lived and they don't have experience that has value. Um, but also honor and recognize that you don't have all the best ideas, that the best ideas are coming from community and respect and value and support and try to make those best ideas real. Thank you, Attica. And anybody else in about 15 seconds, <laughs> we can, we could give a last thought. I would say echo that and show up where there are committees and legislation being made and policy committees for Medicaid and otherwise. Thanks. I think that's a great place to wrap up. So thank you all so much for this conversation. Um, and as we are getting towards the end of our time, I'm going to wrap up by sharing some resources to help all of us work together um, to improve maternal health outcomes. So I wanted to return your attention now to some resources available um, from uh, the Health Resources and Services Administration, our partners at HRSA. Um, they're available now to use to support the blueprint goals. And um, these resources, I said, come from the from HRSA, um, Postpartum Support International, and our uh, convening partner of the webinar today, the Maternal Health Learning and Innovation Center. So first, HRSA's National Maternal Mental Health Hotline provides 24-7 free confidential support resources and referrals to any pregnant and postpartum caregivers facing mental health challenges, as well as supporting their loved ones. Um, this service is available via phone and text in English or Spanish with live interpreter services available for over 60 languages. Uh, the hotlines licensed mental health clinicians, certified peer specialists, and childbirth professionals provide real-time emotional support, encouragement, information, and referrals. Um, next, we uh, wanted to share some resources from our partners, Postpartum Support International, and they're the leading, uh, the world's leading organization dedicated to perinatal mental health. Um, the organization offers some really valuable resources, including free peer support programs. You heard about provider network directories connecting families to perinatal mental health experts, um, ed evidence-based certified trainings for providers and others who are interested in, in supporting perinatal mental health and uh, much more. And they also lead the Mind the Gap initiative to ensure that perinatal mental health is a national and state priority. And that includes a national coalition as well as a state policy series. We welcome your involvement in that initiative and please reach out to us if you're um, interested in learning more. Um, and also our lead partner in today's webinar, the Maternal Health Learning and Innovation Center is an exceptional national resource for maternal health. And we encourage you to visit and engage with their website, which provides information for eliminating maternal health inequities and improving well-being for all families in the U.S. And also coming very soon, the center will launch new resources to advance the White House maternal health blueprint, including implementation guides, issue briefs, and more. So stay tuned there for updates as well. Um, and finally, before we close, just a couple of next steps. After this, you'll be receiving a link to complete an evaluation survey from the Maternal Health Learning and Innovation Center. So please take a quick moment to complete the survey. And you'll also receive the information and resources we shared today in a follow-up email, including the slides and a recording. So finally, we'd like to take, thank you for your time and the important work that you're doing. Thank you so much to our speakers um, for sharing their insights. And we look forward to continuing our work together to build a future where the U.S. celebrates the healthiest moms and babies in the world. 
And on the next slide, we'll share our contact information. Thank you so much for being with us today. And please reach out to us to continue the conversation.